Good afternoon, friends. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share some valuable insights with you. Again, we have a very distinguished panel and I'm going to move very quickly so that we can move into our discussion. We have three distinguished guests, including Reverend Jonathan Brooks, uh, a dear friend, a longtime pastor in the Inglewood community, an activist and writer of the book, Church Forsaken. I believe he'll include a link uh, for that uh, work in the chat. We have uh, Reverend Dr. Jeanette Wilson, who is also a pastor and advisor at Operation Push with uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. and has been there for quite a long time. She's also an attorney and an expert in church law. And lastly, we have Reverend Dr. Walter Johnson, who is a no stranger to us, one of our own, a double alumnus, uh, receiving both an MDiv and a DMIN from the Chicago Theological Seminary, and he is a trustee. Uh, and we do appreciate him and his ministry. And we also appreciate the work that he has done with respect to the Safe Passage program uh, that is uh, offers safety escorting for students uh, in Chicago Public Schools. So today our topic will focus on addressing community unrest. So each of the panelists have a very unique perspective and they've been actively involved working directly with issues and they have had success. So we're gonna hear from them as we talk about this whole idea of how we deal with social unrest. As we were preparing for our conversation today, we agree that uh, the scripture Isaiah 43, 19 captures uh, what we are trying to do in ministry. And I would just like to read that passage to you briefly. It says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So having expressed that thought, we're gonna start off with a commentary from uh, Pastor Brooks, just to talk about his unique experiences in the Inglewood community and opening with the idea of what it means to be present in ministry in the neighborhood that he is serving. So we're gonna hear from you, Reverend Brooks, and then we'll move forward with the other panelists. Thank you, Reverend uh, Smith. I really appreciate the opportunity to be on here, Brian. As he stated, me and him have, have been friends for many, many years and closer than family. Uh, so this is an honor to, to be here. To each of you, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, as he said, my name is Jonathan Brooks. In my neighborhood, everybody calls me Pastor Jay, um, mostly because um, I am pastoring and living and working in a community in which I actually did a lot of my growing up in as a youngster. And so it's it's a return to a community that has helped me become who I am, but also a community that um, most people who grew up in it have a mentality of escaping rather than inhabiting. Um, Inglewood is one of those neighborhoods that I always say people drive through, but don't often drive to. And um, pastoring in the neighborhood has been uh, a gift. But um, one of the things that I, I think is really important for people to recognize is that my main identification as a member of this community is not my pastoral call. It is my residency. It is being a resident of Inglewood. And because I am a resident, because I live here, raise my family here, because this is my home, it makes it a very different um, reality uh, for me in ministry because I'm no longer now there to help those people or there to provide help for those who are in need. I am now impacting the neighborhood in which I live. And uh, Reverend Dr. John Perkins, who is the founder of the Christian Community Development Association and an activist uh, for, for many, many years um, in Jackson, Mississippi says all the time that the people with the problem are the people with the solutions. And I really believe that that's a very kingdom value. And so the idea that being present in community 
present in an active way, not just my address is here, not just this is my zip code, but that I am intimately concerned in how to make communal flourishing happen in the neighborhood, meaning that I have to be a part of uh, what's going on here, knowing uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, making sure that um, I am connected with local organizations, uh, local residents, elected officials, in every way possible, uh, enacting uh, uh, peaceful activities in the community. And I believe that's a, a very core value uh, to our, our Jesus following. And in the fact that the way we understand even our incarnation of Christ, not putting myself in, in the incarnation in any way as a, as a Christ follower, but Jesus shows us through his actions that what we are called to be are people who um, are living and working in the places where we're called to minister. All right, and so I really believe that the rec recognition of incarnational ministry or dwelling and being present in the places where we've been called to minister is actually something that the church has gotten away from. Uh, Catholic parish ministry and things of that nature used to always have this mentality, but we've gotten away from it. And I believe that um, if we can get back to that as our core, then we can see things begin to shift in our communities that have been neglected. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, moving forward, as we talk about this whole notion of community, uh, actually, three of us are from the Inglewood community. Um, I, I grew up on 64th and Morgan, lived there 20 years until I went to college. And Reverend Dr. Walter B. Johnson is also uh, a native of the Inglewood community. And as we pivot towards his unique uh, calling and ministry, we want to lift up his neighborhood based programming, as well as his multicultural organizing in ministry. So he has a very special path that he has taken in terms of what he has done. So we'll hear from you, Reverend Dr. Johnson. Well, first and foremost, again, uh, Reverend, I call you Pastor Brian Smith. Again, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be able to share uh, with this August group and body. And I again want to acknowledge the other panelists who are gifted and talented and doing great work. Uh, I come to this from the perspective of, as you indicated, from growing up in Inglewood, I am a product of what I would refer to of the 60s. And my early understanding about community engagement began really in 1968, but actually prior to that, because uh, I was, you know, I was 11 years of age. And uh, unfortunately what happened, uh, at the year when Dr. Martin Luther King died uh, on the south side of Chicago, particularly 63rd Street, there was a lot of rioting. There were a lot of other things going on. Uh, I was, I, I want to call it indelibly uh, impacted by the life of Dr. King. Uh, not only that, I was impacted by the violence and the other things that were taking place in our community. And so I really, at that age, 11 years of age, was inspired not only by him, but I truly believe my calling began uh, in Inglewood at that time around 11 years of age. And from there, uh, I was licensed to preach at 16 years of age, one of the youngest ones who had ever been licensed to preach in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the Chicago Conference and then uh, ordained and later uh, ended up being uh, going to Chicago Theological Seminary and ultimately being ordained uh, in the AME Church at 22 years of age and also starting to pastor. I pastored now seven churches uh, across the Chicagoland area with the exception of a period of time when I was uh, in Rockford, Illinois and on the west side, on the south side, et cetera, and so forth. But what really was, uh, I guess, the turning point for me was really, uh, and Reverend Dr. Jeanette will speak to it as well for her piece, um, when I was in, I would call it Cabrini Green, uh, which is now near North. I pastored there for 18 years at Wayman African Methodist Episcopal Church on the north side of Chicago. And uh, when I first got there, um, some of the people who were around me said, Pastor, people get shot over here. And I said, yeah, they do, but we are called to do ministry in this area. And so there were issues going on between the various buildings. So we're talking about the whites and the reds and the row houses. 
And so there I was actually really didn't even want to be in the community, even be a uh, pastor of the church at that particular time. But I was assigned there by my bishop. And so I started getting engaged, uh, working with various uh, civic organizations, city organizations, et cetera, and so forth. But the, the real, real, real turning point was that uh, Dantrell Davis uh, got killed. Five-year-old was on his way walking to school, a neighborhood school, Jenner Academy in the area. And so I talked to some other clergy persons in the area, part of the Near North Ministry. You, you muted, Reverend. You accidentally muted. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, sir. And so I said to them that we need to get involved. And so Paul Ballas, who was the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools at that time, had come to me along with some of the other ministers in the area and said, I need a program to keep the children safe. I need a program where these young people are traveling to and fro, uh, Division Street, uh, other areas in the community that, that were unsafe. And so uh, put together a program. And actually this was based upon the program or at least a template that I had written for my uh, doctoral thesis, What Shall I Tell My Children? Where I talked about the community and the church have to merge. They have to come together. There has to be a collaborative that has to be relationship building. So that paper served as a template for what is now referred to as Alliance for Community Peace, which engaged all aspects of the community, uh, the faith uh, community, the civic, the Chicago Public Schools, the state, et cetera, and so forth. We've been around now uh, a little over now 21 years doing community activism, making, we hired parents uh, in the community to be able to make sure that their children were safe. Some of them lived in public housing, others of them did not have, you know, uh, uh, a varied background and skill sets, but we were able to be able to bring them aboard. And now we are, we operate off of the South side, but we also have, I would call tentacles on the north side, on the west side, on the south side, we have 125 persons that work every day, uh, five hours a day, at this point making $14 an hour, uh, and, and uh, at, again, at various schools in the community to make sure that these children are safe going to and fro. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And as we move towards our last panelist, uh, let me just say, I. I've had an opportunity to work with her for some time and I've known her from a distance. Uh, but I really got a chance to hear some insights when I talked to Reverend uh, Dr. Moss uh, III. He talked about you in such a, uh, how would I describe it? He, he was just proud of you, Reverend Dr. Wilson. And he talked about how long you've been serving and how long you've been on the battlefield doing this work. And so as a long time civil rights servant, I want you to talk to us uh, about your background, but then lead us into a discussion about the new paradigm in ministry and service in the public square, because you have such a broad career. Uh, we could talk about you the entire session, but I want you to lead us in our conversation about how we need to reimagine ministry. You're muted. Thank you, Reverend Smith. Um, it's a pleasure working with you. You have so much energy and every time we come up with an idea, you just make it happen. So I know that the school is excited about your energy and your ability to connect people to action. I was not born in Englewood. I was not even born in Chicago. I was born in the South, in a place uh, outside of Ripley, Tennessee, which is a few miles from where uh, Alex Haley's family made one of its stops, Hennings, Tennessee. It's not even a, a dot on the map. I was born in my great aunt's four poster bed because to be born in the hospital, my mother would have had to go downstairs in the basement of the hospital to give birth. And so the doctor delivered me at my great aunt's home on the farm. 
And so I was born in, in uh, this, uh, in the segregated racist South and shaped by what uh, I was able to experience growing up. I didn't live there all of my life. I spent every summer until I was 16. And I said, I don't want to go down there anymore because I didn't understand why I had to call my white peers, Mr. and Miss. And they were the same age as I would. I had to cross the street to uh, let them have the sidewalk. I had to go in, I only went to the movie theater once because I had to go up in the uh, alley and sit in one half of the balcony and smell that buttered popcorn in the balcony and we could not buy popcorn. And you know, from Chicago, I couldn't understand why I couldn't get popcorn. So my cousins wouldn't take me to the show anymore because I acted up about this buttered popcorn. And I said, it's unfair for us to pay the same price, go in the alley, go up the back stairs. And then they had this old man with a cigar box that would bring you some candy. And so it is within that context that when um, Reverend talks about Reverend Jonathan or Reverend Pastor Jay, talks about being proximate. I'm reminded of Ezekiel 37, when uh, God takes Ezekiel on a tour of the community. And really is what do you see? Most pastors don't see the need. They don't live there. And even some that live there, they don't exist. They don't, they are in the, they're in the community, but not of the community. They detach themselves from everything around them. So they don't see the drug dealers. They don't know there's a drug house on the corner. They don't see the children that are hungry. They don't see the schools that are falling down. And when uh, I met Dr. Johnson, I, uh, the weekend, one weekend in Chicago, 12 kids had been killed in a weekend. So I went to my pastor who at that time was Reverend Clay Evans and I said, we need to do something. 12 kids killed in one weekend, which was alarming then, it is not now. And uh, so he was head of the broadcast ministers. He convened and the preachers were explaining why we couldn't do anything. I said, well, if y'all don't do something, the women will. We cannot accept 12 kids dying for no good reason and do absolutely nothing. So started this march, we marched in every community at the same time where the 12 kids were killed. We got pastors to do it, Reverend Meeks, uh, led out in Roseland and Reverend Tyson uh, on the west side and Reverend Evans led a march down State Street into the court and they had all these crazy names about Death Valley and uh, they marched in the Henry Horner home. It was the first time that pastors had ever been in that part of the community and we marching at night. From that we marched every Monday night because we found out from the police that's when the violence occurs between uh, Sunday and Monday night, you get a lot of the shootings and the killings. And I don't know what the, the formula is today. So we would march in the communities as the first time pastors saw how the community looked. There were no men in the community. So when Reverend Johns, Dr. Johnson talks about near North, they, they had you putting men back into communities where they don't exist. You got little boys running neighborhoods making decisions about what goes and comes, what kind of industry exists. And the churches are having a hallelujah moment on Sunday and people are dying on Monday. I went to Cabrini where Dantrell Davis was killed and I was holding a press conference outside the project where he lived because his mother was on drugs. She went to get him and walk him from the school, it's really across the sidewalk to the building. They killed him to send her a message. So I'm standing in front of the building and I hear all this noise and I'm saying, they got to be quiet. And so somebody said, you know, you, uh, you can't mess with them. I was getting ready to go inside the building and tell them, shut up. I'm trying to have my press conference about the murder of this child. And at the time I didn't have sense enough to have the fear because I was so outraged that this little boy died for nothing. And every time we had a child to die, I was working for CPS. I ended up working for CPS 
I attended 33 funerals. I didn't see any ministers other than the pastor who was doing the service because it didn't hit us. And that's why when you look at Ezekiel, the first question is, what do you see? Do you see the pain? Do you see the dry bones? And then the, the second question is, can they live? Well, they can't live if you're not talking to them. If you're not in giving them a sense of hope, you're not doing anything to change their condition. You don't even see them, first of all. First, you got to see the problem. It's difficult to see it from a distance. You have to be there. You have to go there. You have to be intentional about your presence. God took Ezekiel. Ezekiel wasn't trying to go see no dry bones. I mean, I know in his ministry, he's like, God, could you take me to a, a resort? I mean, going to Inglewood at this point, is not, it's not a journey. You don't want to be assigned there. And so I think that uh, as we look at ministry, the new thing is we have to go back and see. You have to see a community that has no employment possibility. You have to see a community that has no commerce. You have to see a school that's falling down and the children wandering around with, in a, with no ability to, to learn to think creatively. You have to go to those grocery stores where you see the mothers cursing a three-year-old out merely because he's active. And, and you have to see mothers uh, struggling, have no income and have no foreseeable opportunity. And when you see that, you have to then be moved to act. You have to believe that there can be a change, that Johnny can be taught, that this community can be revitalized. And if you don't see it and you don't believe it and you don't have hope, how can you give that which you do not have? And I think that uh, God sent us a pandemic so we could do a new thing. And Dr. Johnson knows when I started the Interfaith Community Partnership at CPS, there was no presence of the faith community in the school system. They, they took God out of the schools. They said we couldn't pledge allegiance in the same manner. And they would tell us we couldn't pray when we went in the building. Well, you can't tell me I can't pray. I don't have to pray out loud, but I am going to pray. And the fact that we were putting clergy in those buildings we were going in and we weren't the truant officers. We would, we would go in and, and see, meet with principals and see what was going on in the school building. You could see the filth in a building. So how can I learn in an environment that's not even clean, that is not embracing? Then one other thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> Reverend Jackson took us to Neequa Valley to see the school system. And then uh, we took a busload of kids, students and parents up to Neuqua Valley. And one little girl just started rolling on the floor and, and we were embarrassed, you know, get up off the floor. She said, they got carpet. I can't believe this. It's not right. They brought the kids from Neuqua Valley to DuSable and they said, the gym is obsolete. The floors were, were it's like night and day. Neuqua Valley, they had a, space program where you could, you had uh, the sense that you were walking on the moon. Uh, uh, for science, you had a Bunsen burner on every desk. Every child had a laptop. You go to DuSable, they got a, the chemistry was on a cart. Technology was on a cart. You got to know, what do you see? And then you got to ask yourself, can these bones live? So, we believe they could live and we were gonna do what we could to make them. I believe they can live, but I, the, the question I have is can the church live when you won't come out the building? You made those places mausoleums. So I thank God in a sense for uh, taking us on this journey called a pandemic, COVID-19, so Thank that we might see a new thing. Thank you. So we've heard some things about seeing, about presence, and then being active. If we could lead this conversation forward, I'd like to ask each of you to talk about not only how 
we can get other preachers in the immediate vicinity to see, and I'm talking specifically about preachers that have some connection to the South Side, but how about those who are practicing ministry that are in seminaries? Uh, I actually received a call from a, a, a dear colleague who pastors a church in uh, a predominantly white community in the suburbs. And he came to me and he said, um, Reverend, I know that you work a lot with pastors in Chicago, and I'm not comfortable with white congregations weathering this storm we call the pandemic, and then our Black brothers and sisters in ministry are suffering. How can I become involved? How do we help others to see and to engage and to become involved? So all three of you can talk at this point as we uh, converse, and then of course I guess we can open up the floor for conversation as well. Reverend Smith, uh, what I like to share, and I think based upon Reverend Brooks and Reverend Dr. Wilson and yourself, that we see uh, the church beyond the four walls. We see the church as not just simply the building that persons were going to months ago, but we see it as what I would refer to as beyond, meaning simply that not just pastoring a greater institutional AME church, but I see myself as pastor of the community. And when I saw myself early on in my ministry as, as engaging, not just those who are parishioners in my congregation, but a, 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 as uh, Reverend Dr. Wilson uh, shared, Going beyond that, uh, I think part of the problem of our of, of the church today is that we've kind of gotten lulled into an apathy uh, that uh, other groups have gone out and have been doing engaging in terms of community activism. And then we kind of on the sideline trying to maintain our facility. We're on the sideline trying to make sure we pay, you know, get people to pay the tithes and the offerings and make sure those things that are a part of the structure that are maintained. But when a person, and I just believe this and I'll be off my little soapbox, is called to ministry, I see my calling, not just again, pastoring that local congregation, but I've been called to a greater and higher servitude, which is the past of the community. So when I started my ministry early on, I always envisioned that the church needs to partner up with the various entities of the community. And as a result of that, it's not difficult for me to be engaged or do what I'm doing because I always saw myself and what I believe God called me to be and to do beyond just those four walls. I think we should take the plunge. Uh, we took a group of pastors one on December. It was the coldest day in the year. We, we rented a bus and followed the route. We spent the night out. Uh, we went to feed the homeless and give them some uh, blankets and so forth. Most pastors had never visited a homeless shelter. Mm. So you see them on the street begging for a dollar, but you don't know what they have to do all day long. And then at night to go to a shelter and you got to get there by a certain time. Now you don't have a bus pass. You got to figure out negotiating all day long. You got you spending your day out and about, and then you got to get to the shelter so you can get in to have a warm place to, to stay and food to eat. When we visited the shelters, I saw it's horrible. And then we went under, they used to be under Laura Wacker. We, we went under Laura Wacker and so the, uh, one of the preachers who I thought was a fool said to one of the homeless people, how did you get here? And why are you sleeping on this vent? So then the man had explained the vents blow warm heat. And, uh, and he said, I work every day but I don't have enough money to pay two months security. I mean, so you learned all kinds of things. Then, you know, went on Maxwell Street, which is now a thriving place of commerce on the West Side. And uh, 
this lady had hooked her. She took a, a, an abandoned uh, van, bought, got her some tires and made a couch and a chair. And she had hooked into cable TV on the pole. So I went to give her some uh, chili that we had. And she said I had to bring it to her because she was watching her stories. Well, you know, I couldn't imagine becoming comfortable in that environment, but she had made that kind of adjustment. And so once we saw it and, you know, you realize that this little one point thing we're doing is not enough. We have to change the policies. And, you know, I've said this to the mayor, we can't have these abandoned buildings, abandoned schools, and these homeless people are creating tent cities in our city. We need to take those, put them in the, put them in the schools. We're paying for heat, water to run, lights, and the people wandering in the streets freezing to death. So I think we have to, uh, as Dr. Johnson said, you come out of the building and you got to see this, we pass through the world. I'm not passing a bunch of people that pay me a, a, a check. That's not what I'm called. The God didn't call me to a check. Amen. He called me to serve. And Reverend, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, and as you speak, I want you to also speak about your involvement in commercial development in Inglewood. Sure, absolutely. Um, I'll just say, uh, so for, for, for my ministry, what, what completely revolutionized it was actually listening to the community. And the more I listened to the community and became more active and engaged in what was happening in the neighborhood already, uh, it began to help me change my mentality around what it meant to be a leader here. Um, a lot of times churches have the mentality that we come in and we bring in good stuff or we come in and fix things versus stepping into what's already um, the assets that are already in the community and then figuring out how we can be a part of helping to motivate, stimulate and move things along on the journey. So uh, one of the things that I connected to the Resident Association of Greater Inglewood, if you know anything about Inglewood, RAGE is like one of the largest organizations we have because it brings all the residents and all of the, um, the leaders of, of not-for-profit organizations, churches, all that together in one space to talk about our vision for the community. And um, the young lady who's the president and co-founder of RAGE, Aisha Butler, a good friend of mine, um, some years ago had me on a, uh, we, we had a, a little small TV show on a, a public access channel. And, uh, and they were interviewing me as a pastor who was actually connected in the neighborhood and doing work. And I'll never forget the conversation. Um, one of the, the callers called in and said, hey, I love Pastor Jay, I love Pastor Brooks, he's great. Um, and what his church is doing in our community is great. He's like, but what frustrates me is that Pastor Jay is the exception and he should be the rule. Mm. Um, and I remember sitting there hearing that dialogue and actually it affected me profusely because I was so proud of people saying, you know, Canaan is doing great work, Pastor Jay is doing great work. But then recognizing that the Canaan is not a, a microcosm of itself, right? It's not a standalone entity. We are a part of the body of Christ. We are part of the church. And so um, our connection to the greater church does not diminish because we're doing something different over here. Right? If someone has a bad experience or bad connection or a bad idea about church, we're just church, even if we're doing something different. And so it helped me to realize what I felt like my responsibility was, just to answer your question, Brian, first one, is I left that gathering saying my responsibility now is not just to keep doing great work in the community, but to actually recognize that I'm a part of the church. And now I have a responsibility to get other pastors, other uh, ministries, other religious leaders to recognize, like uh, Dr. Johnson said, that we have to pastor the community. So that's, that caused me to work with a couple of other pastors to create a collective that meets every week called One Inglewood, One Church. It's about 15 or 20 pastors now who work together um, to try to just make sure that our neighborhood recognizes the church cares about what's happening in the community. We don't talk about doctrine. We don't talk about theology. We don't talk about any of those things. All we talk about is Inglewood and what the church can do to be a support in the community. And that's been a great space. It's been a difficult space because pastors think they know everything. But it's a great space because it's humbling us all to recognize it's not about how big and great my church is, but what does it look like for the church to be active in Inglewood? 
Um, that's led to a lot of good commercial things that Brian was talking about. One is we uh, started a cafe in the neighborhood uh, about seven years ago called the Kusanya Cafe, which is a sit down restaurant that is also a gathering space in our neighborhood. And uh, it came out of our church, but it's not a ministry of our church. You wouldn't go there and see Kusanya Cafe and Ministry of Canaan. Um, Kusanya is a neighborhood ministry on the door. It says it's neighborhood uh, owned, neighborhood operated and neighborhood sustained. And the reason why we say that is because we want residents to recognize that this is their space um, and, and that if they don't support it, then it doesn't remain. Um, as well as we have a food cooperative that meets at our church every Monday where people come and shop uh, rather than doing a, um, a food pantry, people come and shop for fresh fruits and vegetables that are grown here in our, we have two gardens, one at my house and one at our church. Um, and so the goal is for people to come to the Five Lows Food Cooperative and actually feel empowered uh, to make choices around their food that are healthy uh, versus just having to go to the local you know, neighborhood corner store and get Flamin' Hots and them little juices that have no juice in them, well, water, food coloring and acid and sugar. Um, and so, yeah, we've just decided to take things into our own hands and do some development, uh, resident led. So it's not waiting for people to come from the outside to do it, but to take the assets of the people that are here. People like Dr. Jeanette Wilson, who are from the South. Those are some of our biggest uh, motivators. Like I learned how to garden by grandmothers and mothers who are from the South, who were saying, baby, you need to get your hand back in the soil um, because African-Americans have a lot of trauma around uh, even seeing ourselves in the soil. I know for me, before I was an adult and my wife got into urban agriculture, every image I saw of a black person in the soil had to do with slavery. And so I can remember visceral reactions to even seeing my wife stooped over in the soil. And I had to deal with my own trauma around that um, and recognize it actually was freeing me, liberating me to get my hands in the soil and recognize that my food comes from the ground and God provides it that way. So there's a lot of development that's happening over here. Um, and it's mostly because our church connected to the community and what they were already doing. Um, but now we recognize that we can't be the exception. We have to be the rule. And so now we're working with other congregations, other pastors, other churches, trying to bring us all together. Amen. So as we talk about it, and we want to open up the conversation now to our wider community, I want to focus on this whole theme of looking at the big C, the big C church. Uh, how can we become leaders to activate leaders? How can we become a part of the collective history of the church? How can we involve all those who consider themselves not only to be churches, but to be people of faith? So that we're, we're looking uh, at the concerns of the community before we look at our doctrine, before we look at our denomination, before we look at our religion. And I'd like to also pose this question to, to everyone listening. How do we uh, develop ways so that our churches, synagogues, and mosques can see, so that they can, can actually participate and make lasting change? And that's open to everyone that is a part of this conversation at this point. Do we have any models that are in place? Uh, and I forgot to mention, uh, all three of the panelists today are a part of uh, uh, the CTS Loose Strengthening Our Leaders Project, and they've been very active in terms of making contributions, uh, leading workshops, and helping to advance our groups. But uh, I'd like to hear if there are any questions or comments around what we uh, just talked about. I'd like to open up the floor for everyone to be able to participate. 